ground down the Nazi war machine. Those left at home faced increasing shortages from mid-1944 as the copious supplies from Normandy and the Low Countries dried up with the steady Allied advance from the Normandy beachheads. By night, the RAF pursued its inexorable bombing campaign against the German cities and by day, massed formations of American bombers pounded away at pinpoint targets aiming to destroy the transport and industrial infrastructure of the Third Reich. Until early in 1944, the Luftwaffe's fighters had been able to shoot down hundreds of American bombers. But with the introduction of the long-range Mustang air superiority fighter, whose drop tanks, Rolls-Packard engine and powerful armament enabled it to accompany the lumbering bomber formations into the very heart of the Third Reich, the German fighters were outclassed. Dire situation. As the Allies wrested mastery of the air from the Luftwaffe, the bombing offensive intensified. It was not directed solely at the German cities, battered as these had become by 1943. Other important strategic targets competed for attention. Prominent among these were the enormous refinery and oil well complexes around the town of Ploesti in Romania, upon which much of the German war economy depended. Germany had no oil supplies of its own and was reliant on what could be obtained from Russia and the occupied territories, particularly Romania. These provided a third of Germany's oil requirements, even when running at half capacity of a million refined tons a month. Their sheer area posed a problem, for they could not be destroyed in a single attack, but had to be totally flattened and put permanently out of commission. As the Allied airmen discovered to their cost, this was virtually impossible. Bombing attacks as early as 1942 had been ineffectual, and it was not until the following year that a considerable force of long-range heavy bombers was available to prosecute a major attack. On the 1st of August 1943, a force of B-24 Liberators based in North Africa took off for Ploesti. This was a heavily defended target, surrounded by batteries of guns and protected aloft by four groups of ME-109 fighters. Some 200 Italian fighters were based on airfields astride the likely bomber routes to and from the target. Casualties reduced the force as it flew towards Romania. Poor navigation led many aircraft adrift and one formation is said to have flown low over the capital, Bucharest, one bomber flying low up the city's main thoroughfare. Chaos reigned over the target as different bomber groups tried desperately to avoid mid-air collisions. The anti-aircraft defences were alert and ready and a tornado of fire greeted the lumbering bombers as they fought their way into the refinery area. Many, flying at maximum speed no more than 30 feet above the ground, were brought down by other aircraft's delayed action bombs. Harried by fighters and riddled with shot, bombers crashed in all directions. Five Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded to aircrew in this desperate attempt to destroy the Ploesti complex. Of the original force, over 57 were shot down, and another 11 had to turn back without bombing. Little lasting damage was done to the refineries. The Allied air commanders, meeting in 1944, had tabulated their list of bombing priorities in order to give maximum support for Overlord, the invasion of the continent. The prime target here remained Ploesti as the single largest source of oil fuels. The task was assigned to the American 15th Air Force, which reopened the Ploesti attacks in April 1944. Persistence paid off. Ploesti was subjected to further raids through the summer, and finally, after four huge attacks in August, each by more than a thousand bombers, the defences were overwhelmed and production of refined fuels ended. Over 300 heavy bombers had been lost, together with their 10-man crews. 
In the end, sheer weight of numbers, the presence of P-51 Mustang fighter escorts and the waning power of the Luftwaffe's depleted fighter force enabled the Americans to win this desperate aerial battle. From now on, Germany had to rely on its synthetic oil plants. The RAF's Bomber Command turned its attention to these small targets, difficult enough to hit by day, even more so at night. Despite heavy casualties, for the air defences over Germany were still as formidable as ever, these attacks were continued to the end of the war. The winter of 1943-44 had seen a series of defeats for the Wehrmacht. Having been driven out of Africa, it was fighting a dogged rearguard action up the spine of Italy, where Mussolini had been ousted following Italy's capitulation on the 8th of September 1943, but where a prompt reaction by the Germans had seen their forces occupying most of the country within hours of the Italian defection. On the Eastern Front, a series of devastating thrusts by the Red Army, following their destruction of the German 4th and 9th Panzer Armies in the gigantic battle around Kursk in July 1943, had steadily forced the Germans back, despite Hitler's insistence that every bit of Russian soil must be held and no retreat permitted. Kursk was a landmark, probably the greatest tank battle of all time, and the last great effort by the Germans to break the Soviets by means of massed armoured formations in set-piece battles. At the same time, Hitler, faced with Allied landings in Sicily, then Italy, found that the nightmare of war on several fronts was a reality. Furthermore, the impending threat of an Allied invasion of Europe, the Second Front, was tying down yet more troops. High-quality divisions had been moved to southern Europe to fight the campaign in Italy, and more forces were deployed in Scandinavia, the Low Countries and the Balkans on occupation duties that frequently involved pitched battles with ever-increasing numbers of assorted partisans and guerrillas. In spite of this drain on their resources, the German generals in the east continued to fight with great skill, inflicting heavy losses on their opponents as they slowly yielded ground. But even after the Allied invasion of France in June 1944 and the subsequent advance towards the Rhine, Hitler was curiously undismayed. He sensed that the Western Allies were finding it hard to agree on the terms demanded in the event of a final victory that now seemed increasingly certain. In January 1943, an Anglo-American summit conference had been held at Casablanca, where Churchill and Roosevelt had declared themselves in favour of unconditional surrender by Germany and its then allies Italy and Japan. Although this kept Stalin, the Soviet leader, happy, he repeatedly voiced his anger that the promised Anglo-American landings in France had not taken place by the end of 1943. He had grounds for this. The Red Army was undeniably bearing the brunt of the war. On the Eastern Front, the numerical odds now favoured the Russians. Three German army groups were confronted by eight Russian fronts, each more or less the equivalent of an army group. The earlier superiority in equipment enjoyed by the Germans had gone. The Soviet T-34 tank, mass-produced, was designed for operation by hastily trained crews. Simple in construction, it combined armoured protection with high mobility and firepower. Its original 76mm gun had been replaced in later marks by a potent 85mm cannon. Although the German Tiger tank was heavier and carried an even bigger 88mm gun, it was heavily outnumbered and prone to mechanical breakdown. 
although nowhere near to the extent that